right. <coughs> so let's get started on the technical deep dive into the new prefab system. Um, if you saw the YouTube video of our Unite Berlin talk, it's not the same thing. Yes, I am going I have switched some of the content. Uh, it's gonna be this, a little bit the same in the beginning, but then we'll go, go deeper into scripting examples. <clears throat> uh, my name is Steen, and I'm the technical lead on, uh, on the new prefab system. Um, what we'll go through today is a little bit about what is a prefab, prefab asset instances. We wanna look at what does prefab contents mean. Uh, prefab importing, prefab mode, unpacking, and then how to do scripting and tooling with the new uh, prefab APIs. Um, have any of you tried the 18.3 demo and worked with the uh, new prefab system? Show of hands. Like one. <laughs> that means you haven't tried the APIs either, I guess. <clears throat> so. I hope your, your takeaway here should be a little knowledge about how the, the prefab work backend works, uh, the changes we had to do to how Unity handles uh, prefabs, and uh, some knowledge about how to do tooling with the new prefab. Uh, some of the goals of this project was obviously to do nesting. As uh, this example shows, you have an instance in the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have an instance in the scene, and it's an instance of the table prefab, and inside the table prefab, there's an instance of the vast prefab, uh, and so on. Secondary, we also wanted to do uh, prefab variants. Uh, the use case for prefab variants is that you, for example, want to have uh, multiple cubes with different colors, but they should all be based on the same base cube prefab, and whenever you change the base, like you scale it, these changes propagates to all of your colored prefabs and uh, cubes as well. Uh, and this also works for models. So you could have a model prefab and you could create a variant from it and you can add game objects and change materials and whatnot. And then your artist goes and change the model and your model, your variant still works. Um, <clears throat> another highly requested feature is editing in isolation. Uh, instead of dragging your prefab from the project browser into the hierarchy, a lot of users have requested, I just want to modify or edit my prefab in isolation so it doesn't interact with the scene and I make mistakes when I apply and so on. Uh, highly requested feature. <clears throat> in order to give some, we had to take some away from you. <clears throat> we have removed the disconnected prefab workflows. You can no longer disconnect a, a prefab instance. And we have removed editing prefabs directly in the project browser. Um, I'll come back to later why this had to be done and what you can do instead. <clears throat> so just to make sure that we are all aligned on what a prefab is, we're gonna do the very basic. <clears throat> Starting point of a prefab is always a game object in the scene. And for simplicity in these slides, we are only gonna show game objects, but everything applies to components as, as well. You wanna make this game object into a prefab, so you drag it into the project browser, and what actually happens is we take the given prefab, we copy it, and we write it to disk, including whatever children there might be, and components, and so on, and we turn your instance in the scene into, or your game object in the scene into an instance of this prefab. But what is a prefab instance, actually? Um, prefab instance is an internal class. Uh, <clears throat> and there's more to a prefab instance than what you see in the scene. Uh, in the scene, you typically see uh, the, the game objects. But what you don't see is the object here called the prefab instance handle. This is hidden from you. Uh, what it does is that it manages all the property overrides that you see on your prefabs. It, has, uh, it knows where in the hierarchy you've attached your prefab instance. It knows if you've deleted any components, not game objects, because you cannot delete game objects from instances. Uh, and it has a reference back to the asset that this prefab is a clone of. Furthermore, each object in a prefab instance in the scene has a reference back to its corresponding source object, as we call it. And there's an API for you to get this. If you have an instance of a prefab, you can say, get corresponding source object, and you will get the object in the assets. 
that's a shortcut for you to go to the asset if you want to know exactly where the, 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 the object came from. Uh, and obviously it applies to all uh, components and hierarchies as well. They, all of them have one reference each to the exact object that they come from. <clears throat> so if you look at what does the scene file look like and how does prefab instances uh, work in scenes. Um, we have your regular game objects and then we have the prefab instance handle and this is all that we have in the scene. Uh, there are other objects and we have marked them, we call them stripped objects, um, which are related to the prefab instance but this is to have uh, stable IDs if you have references from outside the prefab, for some, some other game object in your scene is referencing into the prefab instance, we need to have stable identifiers in order for these uh, references to survive uh, unloading and loading scenes. Um, but this is not included here, it's a, it's a detail. So <clears throat> we load the scene and what happens is that the loading code will see, oh, there's a prefab instance here. Follow the reference to the prefab asset and clone all the objects. Uh, and set it up in the hierarchy for you. And it will also include the prefab instance handle in memory uh, and stick around. So, talking about prefab assets. Um, prefab assets is just a collection of game objects. Uh, but as you'll see, it's, it looks kind of similar to the scene file, right? It's just game objects. Um, <clears throat> so, why don't we just add a prefab instance to our existing prefab. Uh, and this is exactly what we did in order to do nesting. We just included a prefab instance in the prefab itself, and then we had to figure out how do we uh, interpret this. And this is one of the major changes in how the, the, the editor works now. Prefabs are imported. Previously, it used to be that prefabs are just read directly from uh, the, the file in the assets folder, uh, but now it's imported. And this is the reason why you cannot modify the, the, the prefabs in the project folder anymore because it's just a, a source file. Uh, there's nothing there to edit. Everything is imported into the library folder. So what happens is <clears throat> the importer reads the, the prefab file and it writes the, the, the hierarchy back into the library folder, including a prefab asset handle, which is different from uh, the prefab instance handle. The prefab instance handle references the prefab asset handle, and this is how it knows where, where the instance comes from. Uh, this asset handle is completely internal, uh, and, and you don't need to use it for, for anything. Uh, we have references for all objects in the library folder. They know which asset they come from as well. Uh, for internal convenience as well. So <clears throat> let's just add a prefab instance there and have the importer handle it. So the importer will now interpret the prefab instance. It will instantiate it during import and it will attach it to the hierarchy of your prefab and it will write your baked prefab into the library folder uh, including the prefab instance handle and it will set all the references that you can see there, the, the, the arrows on the slides. Um, and basically, this is how a variant is implemented as well. A variant is just a prefab with a prefab instance at the root. And the prefab importer knows how to handle this and, and create the objects in the library folder. And to go back to the corresponding objects that I mentioned before, now, it's, now you have a chain of corresponding objects. So your scene instance, all the objects knows that it comes from this prefab, but this prefab has references to another prefab, and it keeps going like this. The more you have nesting, and the same for variants as well. And this ends up building a dependency chain. <clears throat> so you have an inner prefab, a middle prefab, and an outer prefab, and if you modify the inner prefab, we have to re-import everything in this chain. And if you do really deep nesting and variants, it becomes the big dependency graph, and then modifying a leaf prefab will cause a lot of re-importing. We currently worked with a team that uh, built very, very deep nesting and variants, and the technical artist would modify 
the leaf prefab, and then it would block the editor for a few hours because it had to propagate all the changes. <laughs> Not good. Uh, we optimized it, so it's a few minutes now, and uh, all the optimizations applies to scene loading as well, so you will experience uh, faster scene loading in the editor as well. Um, you might also think, well, nesting, does it have an implication of the build size? And actually, it doesn't. Uh, it's always been the case for scenes that when you build a player, we bake the prefabs into the, the build uh, as regular game objects. Uh, <clears throat> if you then build uh, resources and asset bundles with prefabs, you might have a setup like this, where you have three prefabs, A, B, and C, where A is nested in B and A is nested in C, and A itself is included in the, pref in the asset bundle, and you end up with A being there three times. Uh, it's, it's not a regression, because that's how it was before. Before you didn't have nesting, you had to do this yourself. Um, with nesting, it's done for you, but it doesn't help you improve your build size. It doesn't make it worse either. So, <clears throat> so this is a full picture of what all the references that's going on in the prefab system uh, between an instant and its assets and the, the, the instant handle objects and the, and the assets uh, handle objects. So let's talk a little bit about prefab mode. <clears throat> so prefab mode is what you enter when you want to edit your prefab in isolation. And uh, <clears throat> what it actually is, you get to see what is inside the prefab. You see the contents of the prefab. Uh, we say you're editing the prefab asset content, you're not editing any instances, and this is why it's game object icons when you edit in isolation, it's not prefab icons. And we call it saving instead of applying because you're saving to the prefab. You're not applying minor modifications to the prefab. And we like to say that uh, we consider it as if you are editing the prefab asset directly. It's not entirely true. What actually happens is that we load the prefab as if it was a scene, and then you can modify them, and then you press save, and we write everything back to the prefab. And that's why we call it saving instead of applying. Uh, and there's an illustration here of the workflows, how you have an instance and an asset, and you have prefab mode, and how you can go between the different modes and apply, and uh, instances are updated when you save to the asset, and so on. <clears throat> so prefab instances are great, but sometimes you just want to get rid of them. Uh, you don't want prefab instances in your scene. You just want regular game objects. And we call this unpacking. And this relates to. Uh, the disconnected prefab workflows. We stopped supporting the disconnected prefab workflows. Um, and actually, the problem is not disconnecting. The problem is applying again. If you had a prefab with nested objects and you disconnect it, suddenly you can move object, game objects around the hierarchy. You can like totally redo the hierarchy. Uh, and then what does it mean to apply? because suddenly you might have interleaved objects from different nested prefabs, and where do we apply them? We don't know. So we simply just drew a line and said, no, you can't do it. You cannot modify your prefab hierarchy, and you, because that would actually disconnect it. Uh, instead, you can unpack it. And we also had heard from a lot of developers that they, they just want to unpack a prefab. They just want to remove all relationship between an instance and its asset. And you do that by right-clicking on the instance in the hierarchy, and you say, unpack, prefab. And what you get is the content of the prefab. Um, well, almost. Because what you actually get is it unpacks one layer. So if you had a prefab with nesting, your outermost prefab will turn into regular game objects, but your nested prefabs will turn into prefab instances in the scene. And this can become a little confusing when you are dealing with a variant, because a variant actually becomes its base. So you have a prefab instance in your scene, it's a variant, you right click on it and say unpack, and it's still a prefab instance, but now it's an instance of its base. If you don't care about any of this, and you just want to unpack the prefab, 
and make it regular game objects, you say unpack completely. And you don't have to do this from the hierarchy. You can do it from API. So <clears throat> speaking of APIs, scripting and tooling. The first thing I would like to introduce to you is a new concept we introduced called editor stages. So currently there are two stages in the editor. We have the main stage, which is where all the, your scenes live, all your created objects, they are in the main stage. Whatever scenes you've uh, loaded with multi-scene editing and so on, they all live in the main stage. And then we have the prefab stage. And this is isolated from the main stage, and this is what we use for, for editing in isolation. Um, <clears throat> in the prefab stage, we have our own separate scene where we can load our prefab into and load the contents into. We strongly believe that in the future there'll be more stages, but currently there's only these two. So <clears throat> it used to be that the editor has two modes. It could be in edit mode or play mode. And it was very clear, it was either one or the other. But with prefab mode now, and you go into prefab stage, you, you're in this mixed stage where your main state could be simulating. You press the play button and your main stage, all your scenes are, are, are running as if they're playing the game, but your prefab scene uh, is not. That's still an editor scene. And this has implications on uh, execute in edit mode scripts. Execute in edit mode scripts are often designed in a way where they, in the mono behavior update, will say, is the game playing? If it is, do one thing. If it's not, do whatever my tooling wants it to do. But if you have an execute in edit mode script in a prefab that's open in isolation while you're in play mode, it actually thinks it's playing and it will be simulating your prefab and it will be saving all of these modifications into the assets and it will destroy your prefab basically. It's really bad for you, this. So <clears throat> we will actually leave prefab mode if you have a prefab open that has executed and edit mode scripts on them and you press play, uh, prefab mode will close down. And you cannot open a prefab that has uh, executed and edit mode in it. Uh, what we have instead is execute always. <clears throat> uh, when you have There it is. <clears throat> execute always is an attribute you can put on your scripts now and say, I don't care if I'm in edit mode or play mode or prefab mode, just execute my update. And uh, then you can do something like this. So there's a new API here where you can ask a specific object, am I a part of the simulating world, as in, is this object playing? <clears throat> And then you can do different logic. So this script has execute always. It gets an update, but the object is in prefab mode, so it's not actually simulating. So we are not editing the transform. Instead, we are just editing uh, some random property here. Um, so there's going to be more scripting snippets now. Uh, I have them all on GitHub for you and a link later where you can download them. They are all functional. It's a, it's a fully working project with a, a lot of scripting examples on, of the stuff that uh, I'm be presenting here. Um, <clears throat> so another thing with prefab mode and prefab staging is that we introduce this concept of environment scenes, where often or sometimes when you want to modify a prefab, you want to do it in a context of some other objects. And we allow for you to specify a specific scene as your environment scene. That when you go into prefab mode, this environment scene will be loaded and you can modify your prefab. But this is static. Uh, let's say you want something dynamic instead. So we have new APIs to manage the, the, the different stages. We have this uh, prefab stage API, which is currently in experimental. There's also something just called stage API, which is in the scene management API. 
and we have events like this. If prefab state is opened, call into my function here. And I didn't include the function, but it's in the GitHub project. And this will actually, uh, the, the, the example that I built, will put a plane at the bottom of your prefab and, and um, so it seems like your prefab al always have something to stand on, no matter how big your prefab is. So it's just one example of what you can do uh, with these APIs. But <clears throat> let's look at more APIs because it's also very often useful when you're building tools, you wanna know this specific game objects. Uh, what is it? Is it a regular game object? Is it a prefab instance? Is it a model? Is it a variant? And we have a lot of different APIs for this right now. <clears throat> it used to be that we have prefab utility dot get prefab type, and it would return an enum that was, uh, is this a model prefab? Is it a model instance of a model prefab? Is it a regular prefab? Is it a regular instance of a prefab? Is it a disconnected prefab? And so on. And this was like a multi-dimensional query put into a single enum, so if you wanted to uh, do tooling, you would have to test for what all of these enums to make sure that you had the right kind of game object. Uh, now it's very simple. You can just say, is this a prefab instance and is it an instance of a model? And then you can write your tooling uh, like that. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, I just test, is it a prefab instance? If it is, then I figure out what kind of prefab asset am I a clone of? And that's why it's called get prefab asset type. It's a little weird that you ask the instance what asset type it is, but it's because it's cloned from an asset. Uh, and it will return, I'm a model, I'm a variant, uh, you name it. Um, unfortunately, it's not that simple. <clears throat> because your game object could be uh, a prefab opened in prefab mode, and suddenly it's no longer an instance, it's a regular game object. And then you have to do different APIs to figure out what asset is, is this game object actually from. Uh, I didn't include it in the slide, but it's in the example on, on, on GitHub. You can see how we use the prefab states API to figure out what part, or what asset is this uh, game object actually coming from. Um, <clears throat> so you have two game objects. And again, for your tooling, you wanna know are they part of the same prefab instance or not? Because if they are, you cannot rearrange them in the hierarchy. But if they are from different instances, you can actually parent them. <clears throat> and this is very simple because we have the prefab instance handle, which is unique per prefab instance in your scene. And you can simply get that and compare them. So if you're iterating through the hierarchy, this is how you would determine if you're in one instance and then suddenly in another instance. Cool. I want to create prefabs from scripts. <clears throat> As I said in the beginning, the starting point from a prefab is always a game object. So we create a game object. And then there are two different APIs here. Save as prefab asset will take your input game object, copy it, and write the copy into the assets folder. And it will leave your game object as a regular game object. And then there's a second API, save as prefab asset and connect. And this will actually do the same as the other one, but it will also turn your regular game object into an instance of the prefab you just created. <clears throat> and you can create variants from script as well. The thing is with, with variants, they are an instance of a prefab inside another prefab. So creating variants always have to go through uh, instances. So in this case, we figure out if, if the input game object is a, a asset. You could have selected a, the, game of the, the prefab in the project browser or if it's a game object in the hierarchy and either we instantiate it or not or we find the root of the game object. And then we call the same API as we did in the previous slide. We just save the prefab asset. Save as prefab asset because what it actually does is it takes your input game object and just writes the hierarchy into the assets folder. And it says, oh, you are writing a prefab instance into the assets folder, so I'll just write a prefab instance into the assets folder, and it turns into a variant. 
uh, if it was a regular game object as before, it would be a prefab. If it's an instance, it will become a variant. <clears throat> Nesting from scripting can be done in two different ways. So I, I have two examples here. The first one is we create nesting by instantiating prefab A and prefab B, and we make prefab B a child of prefab A, and then we call a play, apply prefab instance. And what this does is <coughs> it, it looks at the input, which is prefab A in this case, the instance of A, and uh, it figures out, well, I know I'm an instance of this asset, so I know where to write it. And then it just traverses the hierarchy and it sees that, oh, there's an instance of a new prefab here that wasn't there before. I'll just turn that into a nested prefab in, in the assets file. Uh, this API, apply prefab instance, is the equivalent of uh, the old apply all, uh, or the apply all in the overrides dropdown. Um, there are other app apply functions in the API that I uh, encourage you to go look at. Uh, where you can apply specific properties or specific objects. <clears throat> a different way to uh, do nesting from scripting is we do it in the same way that prefab mode does it. We load the prefab content. So there's an API here, say, load the prefab content at this path and it will return to you a root, the root game object of the prefab. And then you can attach another instance to it. And then you call save as prefab asset again, and it writes out the updated prefab. And then very importantly here, you have to call unload prefab contents. What pre load prefab contents actually does is that it creates a hidden scene for you. A, we call them preview scenes. Um, and there's a limited there's a limitation to how many preview scenes you can have in the editor right now. Uh, so it's very important that whenever you loaded some content, you also unload it in, in order to deallocate the, 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 these temporary scenes that you created. <clears throat> so we took away the option of modifying prefabs directly in the project browser. Uh, but there is a workaround. You can do it from scripts. And uh, it's basically the same API as I just showed you. You just load the content and you modify the static flag in this case and you save the prefab back and you unload the prefab content. Now, if you wanna do this on a lot of prefabs, let's say you have a, a big uh, dependency graph and you wanna modify 10 of the leaf prefabs, you don't want to modify one prefab save, wait five minutes for it to import the entire dependency graph, and then you can modify another one. So in the example script that I've provided on GitHub, the first thing this does is it stops asset importing. It says asset database dot start asset editing. That tells the asset database that I'm going to begin editing a lot of assets now. So don't do any importing while I'm doing this. Then the script loops over the selection, and for each selection, it loads the prefab content, does the modification, saves it back, it unloads it. And once it's iterated through the entire selection, I call uh, stop asset editing, which basically tells the asset database, I'm done editing all of my, my prefabs, all my assets. Uh, I've queued up a lot of changes, by the way, because I call save, so please start importing. And that's where it will start importing. So instead of having multiple five minutes waits when it has to re-import through the dependency chain, it just go, happens once. <clears throat> a very common use case that a lot of people have been using with the, with the old prefab system is that they wanna add assets to uh, prefabs. Uh, and this is actually no different than before. You use the add object to asset and you just it will just add your new object to the prefab. What actually happens though is a little different because previously it would attach the, your new object to the asset in the assets folder. But because prefabs are now imported, we attach it in the library folder instead. And then we have to write the asset, the, the library folder objects 
back to the assets folder. Uh, it shouldn't make a difference for you because all the references are now just automatically redirected to the library folder objects instead, and it will all just work. <clears throat> so I said before that you cannot uh, modify your prefab asset directly in the project browser, but you can through this API get, get corresponding source object, you could have an instance and then you call this API and what you end up with is an object in the library folder and then for some unknown reason you decide to modify property on this one. And what happens is that now your library folder is out of sync with your assets folder. And we need a way to save you. <clears throat> so, if you happen to do this, I don't know why you would do this, but if you do, um, there's a save prefab asset. Now, notice the missing as, it's not save as prefab asset, it's save prefab asset. And it basically takes a library folder prefab and writes it back to the assets folder. So, you can do minor modifications on the prefab objects in the library folder and then write them back to the assets folder. There are limitations. You cannot add objects, for example. You can only modify properties and you cannot rearrange stuff in the hierarchy. Uh, you can only modify properties. But should you end up in that situation, there's an API to save you. Um, <clears throat> so I want to end now by saying tomorrow, uh, Nicolina, our UX designer, is uh, gonna go through how to build a game UI using uh, nesting and variants. And she'll be showing a lot of the workflows in the editor and how it works. Uh, there's a link there to all of the example code. Uh, so you can go have a look at the, 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 the scripts that, I, that we wrote in order to, to uh, do the different things here. Uh, there's a scripting reference, it's a prefab utility. It's, it's the same base class as the old prefab utility, uh, but uh, if you set it to 18.3, you'll get all the new APIs and you can read up on, on, on how they work. And finally, uh, visit the landing page if you want the documentation. There's higher level documentation on how the API, how the workflow works, not the API. How the workflow works, there's a, there's a link to the forum where we can give support. We, ran, we are three developers and a lot of support guys on the, on the forum and we will um, try to answer all of your prefab questions there. <clears throat> so I'm 10 minutes faster than our rehearsal, so lots of time for questions. Yes, there are microphones in the back. Yes. Uh, so uh, two questions. The first one is, is there anything in the system that inherently stops an artist accidentally nesting a prefab that has a child of itself creating an infinite loop? Yes. Okay. It cannot and, be done. And, and how sturdy is that? Because... <laughs> if you can break it, I would like to know. <laughs> it won't be me, but I've, uh, I've seen stuff. <laughs> Um, the other question is, you mentioned the stages. Is the Mechanum uh, character editing importer changed over to a stage as well, or is that still its own sort of um, hybrid new scene oddness? Yeah, so the, the, the avatar editor still unloads all your scenes and, and does and reloads them once you're done editing. We want to make it a, a avatar editing stage instead. Okay, so the stages don't unload everything in your scene like no. Mechanum does? No. Okay, so the Mechanum will switch to that, though? I hope point? so. Thank you. <laughs> Different team. You get that answer a lot. Hi there. Um, so you mentioned that uh, when you enter prefab editing mode, it's like setting up a special scene, yes. and then uh, the uh, prefab asset becomes like a game object within that scene. Yes. So how does that scene stand in relation to the rest of the scene, uh, like the additive scene uh, group? Uh, it, it does not. It doesn't, okay. No. So if I have, for example, like edit always, sorry, execute always yeah. in uh, a script in prefab editing mode, yes. and let's say I instantiate a game object yes. uh, into that yes. editing scene, yes. what scene would that be in and what happens in if I In your prefab it? scene. 
okay, and if I try to move it to a different scene, that wouldn't work. It would just error. Uh, <laughs> I, th I, th if, I wouldn't try to do that. I'm just. I, th I, th I think you can actually. If you have the the handles to the scenes in the main stage, you can move them, move the objects. Okay. Uh, but don't do it. So, okay. <laughs> it's it's just a special scene on its yes. own. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Have you run into any issues with version control with the new prefab system? Is there anything to look out for? <clears throat> um, we, have, we have done all we can to make it compatible with, uh, with the version control systems that's integrated in Unity. Um, so if, you, uh, if, you have, if you're using Perforce, for example, uh, your prefabs are read-only, and when you then open them in, uh, in prefab mode, you cannot save them. Right. It'll actually ask you to check it out. Right. That's it? Yeah. OK, cool. Thank you. Two questions. One is, uh, when are prefabs coming out, uh, the new enhanced version? And uh, what would you recommend doing with a project that has extensive prefabs uh, existing? Will they import properly, or is it worth uh, redesign, redesigning them? Um, we're shipping in 18.3, so within a few weeks. Uh, and the, it all upgrades automatically. Uh, all of your prefabs will import. They will not do nesting and stuff like that. Yeah, it will just import as regular prefabs. Um, of course, then your technical artist has a job in, I want to I wanna turn these objects into nesting instead because it simplifies our workflows, but that's manual labor. Uh, so one of the things we're using prefabs for a lot is VFX for our characters. So we basically have like a timeline and then a bunch of objects underneath it that are like VFX. So you might have character, gall, staff, and then prefab uh, like magic missile. And to test that, we're always having to drag those prefabs underneath the character, bind it, and then play the timeline. Yes. And it's not a great workflow for no. applying changes. No. Uh, the stages concept that you mentioned sounds like it could maybe solve that. Like if you open this prefab, load this character, is that possible to do? I would recommend you use variants. Okay. So you, you import your model and you right click on it on, in the project browser and you say create variant. And what you get is a prefab that you can actually edit. So you open that in prefab mode and you attach your objects and save it and they stay in the variant. Then when the artist updates the model, you don't have to do anything. It still has your VFX components and green objects. I see. All right. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned disconnected prefabs is not supported, but uh, I find that I am mostly disconnecting prefabs just as a method of updating within the scene. Yes. Are you still able to update prefabs in context of the scene? Like if I'm doing a UI and I've got elements that stretch to fill, in isolation it seems like it's harder to work? Uh, it is harder to do in isolation, that is correct. Uh, on, it's, it's, it's not something that we support right now. Uh, okay. We have... The, I, I mentioned the environment scenes, and we actually have two different scenes that you can set up, uh, a regular scene and a UI scene, and, all, and you can set up canvases and so on if you want something very specific for your UI. If you don't, we will generate a canvas for you, and you can modify the, the prefab in, in isolation. Okay. Uh, modifying a prefab in context of your current scene is future work that we're looking into. Uh, we want to ship the, 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 what we have now, because we really think there's a lot of value here, uh, but there's still some workflows that we need to implement. Cool. Um, and is there any improvement uh, to serialization? Are we saving copies of prefabs all over scenes still, or are things linked a little bit? Um, so in, I think it was in 5.0, we stopped saving copies of prefab into the scenes. So your scene files should be a lot smaller now. We only serialize the prefab handle and a few objects that you specifically reference. OK. Thank you. All right, a couple questions. Um, one is that if the editing in the project view has gone away, does that mean we can't multi-select and multi-edit variants? Yes. Because that would be helpful if we could do that. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so I, I know it's, 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 a, it's a very hard limitation, and uh, it's, it is a workflow reg regression. I totally agree, because a lot of people were used to like, having 10 different prefabs. They just select them all in the project browser, and they change the static flag, done. 
Uh, you either have to do that through scripts, as I mentioned in the example, or we introduced support for uh, applying multi-selection. So you can actually instantiate all your prefabs. You know, it's, it's, it's a little counter what we really want when, with the editing in isolation, but you can instantiate all your prefabs. And then you can uh, modify the, them, change the static flag or whatever it is you need to do with multi-selection, and you can press apply. And it knows how to apply to the different prefab assets. Um, and th this, is a, this is a workflow we came up to to, to, to uh, make it a little more acceptable for people that they cannot multi-select in the prefab, in the project browser anymore. Okay. Uh, second question was, um, my team reports that if you open a prefab, make changes, and then close it, uh, you can no longer undo or redo. You basically lose the edit stack when you, when yeah. you close the prefab. Yeah. So undo across state changes is currently uh, not clearly defined. Uh, because you could have multiple edits done in prefab mode, and then save and exit prefab mode. Should undo then be a single operation that undoes all your changes, or should it go back into prefab mode and start undoing them one by one as you go through the undo stack? Uh, we haven't decided on that yet. OK, thank you. Hi, quick question around, you mentioned large dependency graphs or very deep nesting yes. uh, causes import um, slowdown. It, was there any overhead on that when it comes to basically scene load time? If I'm allocating or, or loading that prefab at runtime, is that gonna take longer because of the, the deep nesting? <clears throat> so uh, at, at runtime you mean in, in your, on your device? Yes. So it's always been the case when you built for a device the scenes are baked out. So th there is no concept of prefabs in your scenes on the device. So there's no nesting or anything. It just loads as regular game objects. Okay, and, and if I have the prefab as an external resource not in the scene and we're loading that? Then it's just regular game objects with all the nesting uh, removed, just baked out as a complete hierarchy. Thank you. A uh, couple questions, one. Um, in the other demo, it's the prefab view kind of takes over the scene view. Is this, the scene view is not gone? Is it like we can open it in another window? No, the scene view is gone. It's gone. Okay. Yes. Um, the game view is around, but the scene view is gone. Yes, game view is around, so you can put game view and scene view next to each other, and you can modify your prefab in the scene view, and you will see updates in the game view. Um, this is again, it's it's a limitation we agreed on because we want to ship. Uh, we did some prototypes. <laughs> we did some prototypes on having uh, multiple uh, scene views, uh, but then it becomes ambiguous. Like, what, what does the hierarchy show then? Does it show your your scenes or the prefab scene? And uh, what does the inspector show? What happens if you have a, a quad layout of scene views and you start editing a prefab? Should that also be a quad layout or, or a single? I mean, there's a lot of questions there that. We didn't have time to answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, the second question was you mentioned not being able to modify a hierarchy for prefabs now? Yes, in so, an instance. Okay, so like at runtime, if I have instances of prefabs, I can't change their... At runtime, you do not have instances of prefabs. Oh, okay. I have... Clones of game objects. Clones of game, okay. So at that point, I can... Yes. Right. <clears throat> So in mentioning the, uh, the scene for editing one of these prefabs um, and loading a, a, a particular editing scene for that, is that editing scene specified on a per prefab basis so that you can have something that's suitable for editing these prefabs, something that's suitable for editing these other prefabs? Uh, so right now there, there's only two. There's, a, there's a for regular prefabs and for UI prefabs and we detect if, uh, if you have, uh, I don't remember if it's, if it's rect transform. I think it's, if, your, if your prefab has rect transform, we detect it and then we insert a canvas. Uh, or you can build your own UI scene and specify uh, that one as, uh, but right now it's only two. We tried in an early version to have it, like you select the prefab and on the prefab you say, I want this context scene and on another different, different prefab, I want another context scene and so on. But because of the way the asset database work, that required a re-import every time you wanted to change that. So if you had a leaf prefab and you wanted to change the context scene, uh, 
you would again sit in a 10 minute long import dependency chain, which was really annoying. Okay, thank you. I so have you, to stop. <laughs> so you, you mentioned that um, you bake game objects into, or prefabs into game objects in the runtime. Yeah. Um, what if I want to use asset bundles? Can I do that? Can I load like child and the parent object from different asset bundles? Uh, no, they'll bake out. All right. Thank you. So I think there's an Q&A area outside, am I correct? Yes, I'll be out there in like two minutes and, uh, and uh, you can come with your questions there. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.